this is the history of a woman deported to a hard labor gulag. Uh, deportations from Lithuania and from other countries in Eastern Europe uh, were of two types. Uh, one type was uh, to hard labor gulags where the death rates were very, very high. The other deportations were actually larger in number were to less restricted areas. Um, these were into, to do lumber, uh, industry, agriculture, mining, and fishing. In the hard labor gulags, uh, these were under barbed wire with uh, guard towers, with the army, the police, the military presence uh, guarding everything. The death rates were very high. We have on display here as part of the Hope and Spirit uh, exhibit and program extremely rare material from a gulag, uh, which was brought to the United States by Elena Yutsute. This kind of material is basically non-existent anywhere in the world. Um, we are very thankful to the Lithuanian Research and Study Center where this material is housed and was on display prior to it being uh, loaned to us. And we're particularly thankful for Dr. Augustinus Idzilis, uh, the president of the Institute, uh, for arranging this loan uh, for this exhibit. The other person I do need to specifically thank um, is Ms. Irena Balzakas. Uh, she translated all of the uh, information uh, from Lithuania into English and she actually made the entire arrangements and put up the three panels where this material is currently displayed. Uh, she is a college a student at McGill University uh, in Montreal. Elena Yutsute was a mathematics teacher in Lithuania in the city of Pilvishke. Now Pilvishke is right nearby where the Plioplis Kaimas is. This is where my forefathers are from. And on every Sunday, the uh, Plioplis family and relatives will go to the Pilvishke City Church uh, for Sunday services. After the Soviet overtake of Lithuania and the atrocities uh, that were being committed by the uh, Red Army and the Soviet NKVD brigades became well known, uh, she was uh, very appalled by what she saw. She wanted to help out the freedom fighters, she wanted to help out the resistance movement, the partisans. So she volunteered to help out, but she refused to have anything to do with guns, ammunition, weapons. She would only help out with paperwork. And she did that for a few years until she was caught. And so now this was a major affront to the system, and that's how she was uh, sentenced to the hard labor camps. Her first deportation uh, took place um, uh, to the uh, central parts of uh, Siberia and in these images here uh, we see her working uh, shoveling and she's working uh, to repair the Trans-Siberian Railroad. That was most of the work that she did. In these photographs you see that her head is covered. Uh, she's covered actually with this item here. It's a netting to keep mosquitoes and bugs off. And on top of that, she also devised her own additional netting uh, from uh, branches of, of, of trees uh, to kind of keep, keep uh, the larger bugs away. As she's working uh, in the gulag, she always has to have two of her prison numbers on her. Uh, one number is on her front right knee, and the other number is on the middle of her back. Uh, so to identify her, she had to wear that all the time. Being in a gulag was an extremely restricted area. How she was able to get photographs taken of her is beyond understanding. We have something very interesting here. Here is a photograph of a sign written in, in Russian, which means restricted zone. That means the prisoners were not allowed to walk past, and you see a kind of a line of barbed wire down towards the ground here. She took a, had a photograph of the, this sign taken done, and she took the sign itself, and we have the original sign here too, saying restricted zone. And she also has brought back some photographs um, of herself and the places where she stayed. Um, she was there for several years, and it was after the death of Stalin um, that her case was reviewed and, and, and she was released. In 1965, relatives of hers living in the United States convinced the Soviet authorities to, to release her, and she then uh, spent the rest of her life in the United States. This is a photograph of her done in 1955 upon her return to Lithuania, and uh, this is uh, with her resting uh, at work. 
uh, in Siberia. This is the actual number that she had to wear on her front knee and on her back to identify her. These were uh, Cyrillic letters in Russian that she had to wear in the gulag in Siberia. Upon her return to Lithuania, while her case was being reviewed, she was in a high security prison camp there, and these were her prison numbers that she had to wear. In Siberia, she did do handicrafts herself, and this is one of the pieces that she herself created. Upon arriving in the United States, she had time to collect her reminiscences and published a book, uh, which was then uh, translated Footprints in the Death Zone, uh, written by her. Now this here is a map of parts of the, where she was deported to, which she did do herself, and with the city location, Lake Baikal is here, Lithuania will be far, far away, and some of the places where she worked. Now a friend of mine pointed out a point of humor that she put in here. The, she put it here, the farthest, most distant location, Soviet Skaya Gavana Havana. There is no city there called Havana. Havana is in Cuba. And in, the, in those days, it was still a, area, a city of uh, much uh, uh, tourism, much pleasure. And uh, this was just a, a joke that uh, uh, sort of a, a city that she created out of her own humor. Elena Yutsute brought back with her some other artifacts uh, of her life in Siberia, in the Gulag. Uh, we have a series of pieces created from straw, colored straw that were cut up and assembled and glued down on thin pieces of paper. Very beautiful Lithuanian motifs. They were handmade. These were not made by her, but they were given to her and she took them with her from, from Siberia. Most of the people of Lithuania are religious, a Catholic. Uh, the new so Soviet system was not. People would make a rosary. We have two rosaries on display here. Both of them were made from fragments of bread that had been chewed, made soft, and then created on a string. So these are fragments of bread producing a rosary. We have a second smaller rosary here also made from uh, chewed bread fragments. The birch bark was used to make cards with designs and pictures and uh, some of these were sent, but these were brought back uh, by Elena Yutsute as, as other people's artwork. This is the materials and instruments that were used to produce the, handy, uh, the handiworks uh, that the ladies, uh, Elena herself, used um, in her creations, artistic creations. Besides working on the Trans-Siberian Railroad, Elena Yusute also for several years worked in a mica mine. Mica is a rock substance which can flake into thin, large flakes, uh, which are used in the electronics industry uh, for insulation. It's particularly good in areas of high temperature, and the few places in the world where it can be mined and found is in Siberia. It continues to be in use currently. She took several of these sheets of mica, made a small booklet of them, and on the pages inscribed uh, certain things that she wrote. On the first page, she wrote that she's writing this from Camp Collective Number 21, and she's doing this on May 22nd of 1951. Uh, one entry is of interest. She wrote, Can it be that brutal Siberia will not let us return home? No. The Lithuanian is patient. Nowhere will he disappear. He will win back his freedom. This is the same concept with, with, that the Hope and Spirit Project is all about. Uh, hope and Spirit eventually did lead many decades later to the freedom of Lithuania and all of Eastern European countries. It's thanks to people like Elena Yutsute that we have this material on display here. I'm sure that she was at considerable risk taking these items from the gulag, hiding them, and then eventually get, transporting them with herself uh, in 1965 to the United States. She wanted her experiences not to be forgotten. She wanted actual physical material from the horrors of this lifestyle preserved, put on display, and explained to people. I'm continuing her desire. This entire program of Hope and Spirit, this entire exhibit, including Elena Yusuza's material, is to remember what happened in the days of Stalin and not forget it. If we forget it, history will repeat itself. At the same time as Stalin was killing Hitler, was killing people, including very large numbers of Jews. Holocaust museums have been established across North America and the world. 
the issue of the Holocaust is not forgotten. And that's correct. That's the way it should be. Even with the Holocaust being known by everybody, there are countries and rulers of countries who want to repeat it. It's much worse with the issue of what Stalin did. People don't even know about it or even aware about it. There are countries that are run as Stalinist dictatorships right now. Uh, Belarus and North Korea are examples where human liberty is suppressed totally. Within the vast previous Soviet empire, there's a very large percentage of people who still adore and revere Stalin. History can repeat itself. It's very important for us to remember it, to commemorate it, and to not forget it, just like Elena Yusuta did.